What we're going to talk about today, and have we said the title? Can I no, not say? yet. Go, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> we're going to talk about the prosperity gospel. And, you know, Jared, to me, the, the, the real danger of the prosperity gospel is that it actually has the real gospel in it. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the prosperity gospel, you'll hear of Jesus. Uh, you'll hear that he's the son of God. You will hear that he died on the cross for our sins. And that is what makes the prosperity gospel doubly dangerous because it doesn't deny the core the truths that doesn't deny the Trinity. It doesn't deny Jesus work and death on the cross, the resurrection, salvation. The danger is that what it does is it takes that and then it, and then it places all these things around it and leads people to think that because Jesus died on the cross, this is what it means for this life for God's people. And it's it's so subtly dangerous because it, it does have the gospel, if I can say, in kernel in there, and then it does something very um, wrong in terms of distorting God's intention in making someone his child and what that means for them in this life. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk about it uh, and, and specifically to do this show is because I'm angry about it, and I, I, I know plenty of people who... I know plenty of people who turn have either turned away from from God or they you know they 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 put a shield up they don't want anything to do with it and I you talk to them and you ask them why and it's because well I, I some people well, I've I've tried it they promised everything and uh, this is I, I got none of that it's it's not any, it's not what it's cracked up to be how how can God make my life better like this how can God allow this to happen how can God do this well because they've got a false belief of what Christianity is because of the way people preach about it. And when I asked before about it, about it being controversial, I think it will be controversial because I think there are plenty of people, probably within the sound of our voice, that do subscribe to this, that watch some of these people on TV, that go to some of these churches. Well, there, there are many because these, uh, these teachers could not have millions and millions and millions of dollars. They couldn't afford to be on television worldwide if there weren't people who if there weren't people listening to them and more than listening but actually following what they're saying giving money to them and the reason i'm so glad we're talking about this jared because if if the person who doesn't have faith hears this message from the christian church saying uh, christ is the way you you need to believe in him to be saved if they don't see the church willing to deal with its own issues and to confront its own errors it's just as you're saying, there, there are many people who are put off by this kind of teaching, who are actually driven away from God. And if the church isn't willing to, we can't just always look at the world and say, oh, you're lost. Right. You, you know, you need to get saved. While it, all the while we're refusing to deal with um, the errors and sin within the church. And I think if the world were seeing more of that, if they were in, in actually, if you go back into previous generations, this is why the church had creeds. There were errors. And so the church, there, there were those times where the church came together and said, we've got to make sure we are declaring what truth is and what truth isn't. There were, there were very real, um, drastic at times punishments that came to people within the church who misled other people. And the church isn't really doing that anymore. You know, you, it, the issue is if you can get on television and sell books, your books will be in a Christian bookstore. There's no discernment about what, what is this person actually teaching? What do they what do they believe? The issue is, will it sell? Yeah. yeah. And the church is um, in many ways, it's just prostituted the truth because it really boils down to big numbers, um, exposure. Is this person on television and can they crank out dollars? Right, right. Um, and it kind of plays into what we were talking about last time when you were on. And I, I, I always get nervous. I'll give you a good example, okay? I was at a bookstore yesterday, and I saw a book that had a title that looked like it might be interesting. And it, uh, it, it was a religious book, okay? Um, but then it says on the front of it, you know, over 2 million copies sold. I start to get nervous when I see those kinds of numbers. Well... You know, there, there are books that have sold. Um, well, the Bible has. Well, yes. You know, <laughs> now, here's the marvel. I say this to my people. If you want to know the books you want to read in a Christian bookstore, uh -huh. find the bin where all these books are just tossed in a bin and they're four ninety nine. Because I'll bet you, in most cases, what they're classic works, they're, they're works that are, which they don't, they're hardly selling. Right. 
You know, I mean, you, you can look in one of those bins and find Pilgrim's Progress for four ninety nine. Ninety nine cents on Kindle. Okay, ninety. All right. So there you go. And then what are the books that get shelf space? You know, with the uh, professionally done picture and that claim, the two million sold. This is what we think means something. Mm-hmm. Or you know, uh, this author was on Oprah, or you know, whatever. The, the church has become so worldly in its thinking. We think if it has worldly success, that must mean God's blessing it. And all the while, it can just be filled with error and things that are counter to Scripture. But the the issue again is, has it become popular, and will it crank out dollars? And you know, Jared, I'm not reluctant to say and I do mean this. Christian bookstores. If, if we were showing discernment about truth, half, well, you know, what's the percentage? A large amount. Of a very large percentage of many. the books that are in there. If, if, you, if you would take what's in our Christian bookstores and you would go back to the time when the Apostles' Creed was written, if you'd go back to uh, the time of the Reformation when the Westminster Confession of Faith was written, when the church was so concerned about protecting the truth, the great majority of what's in our Christian bookstores today wouldn't make it and, and the, be condemned, quite honestly. And, I mean, that's really the scary thing to me. How, I mean, I just use tell you what's going on with me. I, I have gone to a couple of Christian bookstores, right? And I, some things you know, okay, that's probably not something I want to touch. But otherwise, unless you do a lot of research... You can't just go and pick something up and trust it. You just can't do it. No. Same with the TV shows. And, you know, and I'm not attacking Christian bookstores. I think they have their, and I know that many of them are, are owned by Christian people who, you know, they really have a desire to get truth out there. Um, but we need to say, all right, let me, I'll mention a name, for example, uh, T.D. Jakes. T.D. Jakes is uh, in his belief system is he's what is called a modalist. Um, he denies that God actually exists in three persons. Um, what he believes is that God is one person who then manifests himself in three different ways. So at one point he's the father, and the other point, another point he's the son. Um, you know, the church actually confronted that heresy. Uh, somewhere around, I'm throwing a number out, somewhere around 400 A.D. Um, that's how old this uh, heresy is, and it wrote a creed uh, called the Athanasian Creed to address um, the heresy of modalism. And um, here, here, modalism is alive and well. It, it denies this core essential truth about God, that he's one God who exists in three persons, um, not one person, you know, kind of putting on the father mask now, the son mask. And, you know, Jared, to be honest with you, the, the thought in many ways, and I, well, what does it matter? Mm-hmm. You know, as long as, long as it, you're saying God, you're saying Jesus, you're saying spirit, um, and as long as you're sincere about what you, so you can go into any bookstore, here's T.D. Jakes everywhere. And there was a time when the church said, this is a heresy, and that teaching is so dangerous that it can actually jeopardize salvation if you're teaching this to people um but it doesn't matter now in somebody like td jakes too um you listen to him and you can I, i'm looking at some clips online right now they're all 10 9 15 minutes long uh seven minutes of that sounds good i mean it sounds like good biblical exactly. teaching and he's exactly. had very knowledgeable of the subject but then there's those two or three things that mislead people and inevitably those are the ones where people are applauding and standing up and uh, that, that are the dangerous things. And you're right, it's not just the Christian bookstores, it's, it's Christian music, and it's preachers, and it's TV, and it's churches. It's happening all around us. Yeah, and we got to understand, Jared, that Christian music um, would be a fine example of the, the non-Christian, non-faith world a couple decades ago understood there's big money to be made with Christians. So whether it's music or publishing Bibles, and what you had happen was that a lot of what we would call secular companies came in and bought out Christian music labels. Um, And what happened was that many of those things that were ministry at one time who had a real um, commitment to truth, they sold themselves out to larger companies. Sony, I think, bought a number of Christian music labels. And what happened then, because they have their hand on the steering wheel now, the issue is selling, Mm -hmm. not so much truth. 
and whether it's Christian music, uh, Bible translation, Christian books, this is, it's all essentially money driven now. And when we talk about the prosperity gospel, you, you can f follow the money is the, is the refrain. It, ultimately, that's where it comes to. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing. Your prosperity and your health in this life. And, you know, we'll talk about the particulars. But. We're going to do it. That's, what, that's the way we'll do it. We'll talk about it coming up. I'm going to ask you to explain, explain it to us, you know, what people are teaching. We're going to play a couple of audio clips. Um, and, and I'm a little even afraid to do that because I do that. I see someone's tuning in. They're hearing that. They're thinking that's what we're saying. <laughs> but we're going to do a disclaimer before we do it. Uh, then I'm going to, we're going to talk about it a little more. I've got some audio clips of people speaking against it. And uh, then uh, towards the end of the program, we're going to try to dispel it, I think, a little bit. Right? It's kind of what we're going to do. With God's help, I hope so. Um, 934, this is a talk of Delmarva. Like I said before, I, I know for a fact that, you know, you are probably sitting at home on a Sunday night. Maybe you're sitting at home by yourself, and you're thinking to yourself, hey, you know, it's Sunday, I, I, I need to be doing more for God. And so what do you do? You, you, maybe you didn't go to church that day, but you, oh, there's plenty of religious broadcasts on TV. I'm going to watch one of these religious broadcasts. Right. Are you being misled? That's what we're asking. And uh, if you are being misled, you got to start thinking about the, the final consequences of that. Um, and I... I I do I do not envy the uh, the weight that that's, that's even on somebody like you, Gary, to have to to have to teach people the truth. You know what I mean? I I don't envy that, and I especially do not envy the uh, the people who are purposefully doing it uh, uh, misleading people. Uh, it's nine thirty five. This is a talk of Delmarva. More of your phone calls coming up uh, towards the end of the program. Uh, okay, so Pastor Gary Knapp's here, and uh, we're talking about the prosperity gospel and uh, how dangerous, absolutely dangerous, this, this teaching is. Let me ask you that first, I, I think. Uh, why, why dangerous? Why do you feel this is dangerous? I mean, I know that it is. Why? Well, Jared, it's dangerous. Um, first of all, anything that um, contradicts what God has revealed is dangerous. Um, and it doesn't matter then if you include a lot of what God actually has said in it, which, you know, again, this is the subtlety of the prosperity gospel is that it does take a truth about Christ and his work. But then what it does is it uses that as the foundation on which to build this claim that it's God's will for, um, for his children to be prosperous, um, which includes monetarily. Um, money possessions also their their physical health so we you might at times hear this called the health and wealth gospel and so and the danger of that Jared first of all it's not what God has said and second of all I was actually looking this morning um, in uh, in the book of Deuteronomy when Moses he's led the people up to come into the promised land I think it's chapter 8 and he warns them before they cross over to go in and he mentions to them all the good things they're going to have in the land of Canaan that God's given them, this land referred to that flows with milk and honey. And he says, you're going to have houses you didn't build because you're going into conquest and you're going to have vineyards and all that. And he says, be careful once you get there that you do not forget the Lord your God, that you don't become proud in your heart and say, my hand obtained all these things for me. And I would, I would just ask our listeners if they're, you know, I'm, I know there are listeners who have a real relationship with God through Christ, your closeness with God, would you say that you find you're closer with God when all things are going well and you seem to have everything that you want? Or are you closer when you're struggling and facing times of difficulty? This is our nature. Our nature is that um, the more we have the more ease we have, actually, the further away our hearts tend to stray from God. And um, given our fallen natures, Jared, um, having so much of this stuff, and I do want to talk later because it is true that God does make some of his people wealthy. I don't want to deny that that happens. But the great majority of us, the more we have and the more easy we have it, the more our hearts tend to stray from God. Mm -hmm. And the danger of that teaching is, first of all, that it's essentially saying to everyone, this is what God wants for you. It's making it a matter of if you have enough faith, you can have it. 
the harm that does to people that if they don't end up with it, then they're like, what, I, do, I don't really have faith then because I didn't get the money, I didn't get healed, I didn't get... And it leads to a worldliness in us because that's what having a lot of things does to us. It makes us love the things and our hearts get attached to the things we have. Mm -hmm. And very subtly and even slowly but progressively, our hearts are more and more off God and onto the things that we're getting. And, um, you know, the Bible speaks. Let, let me just quickly say this, Jared. Um, if, if prosperity is... Uh, promised us by God in Christ and his work on the cross, why would Jesus come to us and say, um, it's easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven? Right. So my immediate, when Jesus tells me that, my immediate thought is, should, should, I, should I be seeking wealth? Should I, should I be having my eye honed in on it and say, you know what? I want to be wealthy when my Savior warns me um, that there, there are not many rich people who enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, th that doesn't compute, does it? Would Jesus give that warning and yet his gospel mean that he wants everyone to um, prosper? You know, and we do need to talk about, Jared, does God meet his children's needs? Of course he does. But we're talking about something beyond that and us making that our focus as opposed to does God want to send one of his children wealth and make them wealthy? Well, he does, but that's different than me pursuing that and weaving that into the gospel and saying it's promised me if I belong to Christ. Um, I'm going to play a clip for you, okay? And then we're going, I, I got a, a, a thousand questions to talk to you about that because I'm, I, I know that that message isn't going to resonate with people. People are going to hear that and they're going to say, uh, well, wait a second. So I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not to try to be successful? Um, the same way that whenever you start talking about pride, people say, well, I don't think it means pride that way. Um, people are going to not want to hear that message. Well, yeah, and Jared, you're, what you're holding before us is the, the very... Uh, proven truth that none of us really think that what God has to say is for us. Yeah. It, it's always for someone else. It's a, but it, it, no, no, they're not me. Not what I'm doing. Not and, <laughs> and it's 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 that simple truth that we often we don't want to hear what God is saying. We might say He's saying it, but certainly not to us, and not in regard to our lives and what we're doing. And that's just not safe ground to be standing on. Right. Or that's not what it means. That's not what he meant by huh. it. He didn't mean right. that. Right. Um, okay. This is, I haven't screened this entire clip, but I'm going to play a second of a new one. <clears throat> I want to talk to you today about living in total victory. A little over 2,000 years ago, they crucified Jesus on the cross. They put him in the grave and they thought that was the end of it. But thank God, on the third day, he arose. He said, because I live, you shall live also. He wasn't talking about just breathing. He was talking about living an abundant life. Not a barely get by life. Not a life filled with bad habits and addictions and lack and mediocrity. No, because of the price he paid, we have a right to live in total victory. Now, I want you to get that down on the inside not partial victory to where we have a good family, we have good health, but we constantly struggle in our finances. That's not total victory. And if God did it for you in one area, he can do it for you in another area. Get a vision for it. Don't get stagnant. Maybe God's blessed you and you have a good family, a good job, but you've had pain in your body for years and years. You used to stand against it. You used to believe you could be free, but now it's been so long, You've just decided, this is my lot in life. Joel, I guess this is my cross to carry. He has paid the price so that we may be totally free. That means free from bad habits and addictions, free from fear and worry, free from discouragement and depression, free from poverty and lack, free from low self-esteem. You need to start seeing yourself the right way. You are not a sick person trying to get well. You are a well person fighting off sickness. God made you healthy and whole. The scripture says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, long before 
God laid down earth's foundation. He had us on his mind. Because of the sacrifice Christ made, we are... I think that's good. Um, okay. That is, it's Joel Stein, right? I mean, right. I, I tell you what, you see, his, you see his books everywhere, you see his face everywhere, on TV everywhere, Larry King, I mean, everyone's talking about him. Yeah, and I, I think one of the titles of his books is very revealing, Your Best Life Now. Um, and, you know, that's at the now. heart, yeah, that's at the heart of the, um, of the prosperity gospel, Your Best Life. Listen, um, I rejoice to say that having Christ in my life means a number of wonderful things for the here and now. Um, the Christian faith is not just the sweet by and by. Um, Christ has blessed me and my family with um, so many wonderful things that cause me to rejoice now. I, I can think back on the time when I wasn't a Christian and I was dead while I lived, and I, I believe I live now. Um, by God's grace, I, ha I have a nice home, I have a family, but that isn't as good as it gets. My best life isn't now. My best life is a way, to, it, it, gets, it gets much, much better than now. And I've got to wait for that because it's not actually going to happen in this realm and in this age. My best life is in another realm, in another age. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just that very title of one of his books, Your Best Life Now, um, that, is, that does not compute with uh, the teaching of Scripture. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are things that we've all been blessed with. But that's not to say that adversity is not going to come our way as well. It's not going to say that we're not going to be in pain. It's not going to say okay, we're yes. not going to need to... Right. And Jared, you're hitting on, I mean, we got to talk about this. One of the huge problems with the prosperity gospel is that it does not, it does not acknowledge that there is a purpose and something that can be very beneficial from difficulty, excuse me, um, even poverty and suffering, that, that God actually has a purpose in troubles and sometimes illnesses and allowing us to... Uh, for things to be tight financially, that God has a purpose for that and he uses that very frequently. The prosperity gospel essentially denies that there's any purpose from God in affliction, trouble, um, poverty, ill health. And I'm not saying that God wants us always walking around that way, but there are seasons in our lives when that's what God does because God is out to do what's best for us in regard to our souls and where we spend eternity. And he knows as God that sometimes the best thing that could happen to you or me could be an illness or to be in pain right. because he's thinking long-term. He's not thinking just today. Um, I, I just keep going back to the C.S. Lewis quote I read the other day. Okay. It said, uh, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks to us uh, in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It's his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I, I get to thinking about how much, how many people have come to truly know, to know God, to know Jesus in pain. That's, I mean, how many stories have you heard about somebody who has hit rock bottom that's, that's, that's in pain at the time? And right. it's not a promise that Jesus is going to make that pain go away. It's a promise that there's something better after that. Yeah, and you know, Jared, I think one of the prime examples of that is the Apostle Paul himself. And you, you, he tells us in Scripture that um, there was a thorn he had in his flesh. And he doesn't tell us what that was, although we might, from reading Galatians, it might actually have had to do with his eyesight. We're not sure. Mm -hmm. And what he says is that he went to the Lord three times about that he wanted to be healed. And the Lord's response to that was no. And his, the Lord's response is, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is perfected in weakness. And so Paul says, you know what? Then I'll glory in my weakness then. Now, let's, uh, here's my point. Uh, of, of all people who've lived in all the history of the world, are there many more people who had more faith than Paul? Now, what's the prosperity gospel have to say to Paul in that instance? The only thing it can say is, Paul, you didn't have the faith. If you had the faith, you would see. And 
are we going to say Paul didn't have faith? It's, it's, it's an absurdity. I mean, how, it's, how did Paul die? Huh? How did Paul die? You know, the scriptures don't uh, tell us about how he died. Church history, um, he was martyred. I mean, that and doesn't sound the, like uh, your best life now. Huh? Doesn't sound like your best life now. <laughs> no, but you know, it's interesting. You, uh, you read of a number of the martyrs who um, sang at their deaths, who, in a sense, were victorious while they were <laughs> in agony. And, um, and Jared, just how are we on our... We've got four minutes. Okay, real quick. Here, let's, the prosperity gospel basically is if you believe you will have okay now here's my question who is the founder of our faith the lord jesus right the lord jesus who says that he did not have a place to lay his head foxes have holes birds have nests but the son of man has no place to lay his head okay um did jesus wear two thousand dollar suits um did jesus live in a palatial home with a fence around it um, then we go from him to the apostles don't we and the prophets what do we know of the apostles and pro here are the men who had more faith than anyone and is this what we see in them you you go to paul and he's going to say in corinthians that of the apostles um, they're in rags um, sometimes they're in hunger they're in thirst are, are, are we going to say, well, men, you just don't have faith, because if you had faith, you wouldn't be in rags. You'd be dressed nicely. You'd be eating sumptuous. Jesus, the prophets, and the apostles, their lives do not match the prosperity gospel, do they? Right. Can I feel safe to believe that teaching when my master didn't live it, and his apostles didn't live it, and his prophets didn't live it? It's a lie. <laughs> we we could just well, wrap, I, we could just wrap up the show right now. I mean, really, it's over. It, here's what I'm th here's what I'm thinking. What 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 was offered to Jesus uh, uh, right before the crucifixion? What was offered to him? Well, yeah, all the kingdoms of the world, right? No, I. What's the difference? Yeah, and and to me, here's my question: how how does anyone teach this, or how does anyone feel safe believing it when they look at their Savior and when they look at his apostles and prophets and see that this was not their lives? Not only that, they were all, they were all killed. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the, the ultimate end of that is that the great majority of them actually lost their lives for their faith, right? Crucified, yeah, stoned I mean, to death. I mean, Jesus, as he sends out the, the apostles, tells them, don't take a bag or purse with you. I, I, you'll just be provided for on the given day as it's needed you have to trust me for that even the you know even the israelites in the wilderness what you'll get your manna it'll be there in the morning right. you are not to keep any of it overnight uh -huh. right right this is this is not it's not in the lord jesus and it's not in those he chose who were the greatest people of faith who've ever lived if if faith gets you all this why do we not see that happening in their lives people use a lot of different things uh to mean other things. They misrepresent things. And so uh, I, one of the phrases that keeps coming up, ask and, ask and you shall receive. Ask and you shall receive. I want to talk to you about that. Yeah, because okay? there are tremendous promises, and faith can do many things, Jared. Uh, and I'm glad you're saying that. We've, we've got to deal with all the truth, and yeah. there are wonderful promises, but they've got to be understood in their proper context within God's truth. And it's really the context, too. I, I, I've been hyper-aware lately of people saying, well, this isn't, okay, that's in the Bible, but it's completely not who yeah. it was meant for. Uh, you know, yeah. One of the key passages, I, Isaiah 53, you know, by his stripes we are healed. Um, and, you know, people go to that verse, they take it to the bank, and that, that means it's God's will always to heal you of your physical. And the whole context of Isaiah 53 is our sin. That he, yeah. It has to do with his stripes, healing us of our, in the words in the chapter, transgressions, iniquities, it, it's, it has to do with our sin. Now, I don't mean that Jesus doesn't heal. He can and he does. But to take a verse like that and hold it forth to people and say, oh, by his stripes we're healed, just believe you'll be healed, it's, it's untruth. 
We'll talk about it coming up. Okay. It's 10 o'clock. This is the Talk of Del Marva. Uh, we've been talking here about uh, the prosperity gospel. And, you know, like you said, it's also uh, about health, health, wealth, and unlimited happiness, right? Yeah, Jared, I don't think you can really divorce uh, from a discussion about the prosperity gospel. You immediately think the money, uh, material things, but the whole issue of health, and it even, you know, that introduces even the whole realm of the faith healing, uh, many of the faith healers that you see on television. In almost every case that I, you know, that would come to mind, many of the faith healers are proponents of the prosperity gospel. Um, so what do you say to somebody who, who uh, what do you say to somebody who believes this then, Gary? Because I, I got a couple of clips we're going to play uh, yeah. of that. Um, I think, let me, let me just go, I'll do that one first. Let me play, uh, oh, here's a woman saying the prosperity gospel ruined my life. Um, Joel Olstein says Christ is not the only way. Let me just play that just for, it, it, sure. it doesn't really relate it, but I'd like you to hear it. Anyway. Um, give me a second here. Here we go. Kind of. Okay, here. Nation, bed of truth. Yeah, I would agree with her. I believe that. Yeah, That's what here we go. Tells us that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the light, and the only way that the Father is through him. That's not really a message of condemnation, but of truth. Yeah, I would agree with her. I believe that. So then That's a what Jew is not going to have. No, I... I, I mean, can't it? Well, no, here's my thing, Larry, is I can't judge somebody's heart, you know. I don't know. Only God can look at somebody's heart, and so... I don't know. I just, to me, it's not my business to say, you know, this one is or this one isn't. I'm just saying, here's what the Bible teaches, and I want to put my faith in, uh, you know, in Christ. And I, I just, I think it's wrong when we go around saying, you know, you're not going, you're not going, you're not going, because it's not exactly my way. I'm just, I'm but not going to be the God. Your okay, way. the reason why I believe my, right, the reason why I'm playing that because I want to go back to the danger of 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 somebody who is trying to teach other people, and they're not willing to to. They're not willing to say either way what the truth is. Right. And, Jared, I think, you know, the deceptive thing of what he, one of the things he said there is, I'm not willing to say this one's going, that's not, because they won't see it my way. Well, the truth isn't about him. Um, you know, Jesus is the one who said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Okay? Jesus said that. That's not my truth. And when I say that, I'm saying it because he said it. I'm not dreaming that up in any number of verses and hmm. you know you're you're mentioning Joel Osteen there and um you know there was a time when you'd have this kind of discussion and I was reluctant about you know well you should you should you mention the people who do this I, you know maybe that's not very nice mm -hmm. um and with time I've actually realized that um God's call to his shepherds is to warn the sheep about wolves and you can't just talk about this in some uh, way that isn't what well, people are listening. Who are we talking about? Who, you know, and I think Joel Osteen is, I think he's dangerous. Uh, but he's not the only one. Absolutely not. No, there's, there are many. But let me, if I could, we were talking on the break about him. Um, and if you touch, take what we were talking about with what he just said there, this unwillingness to declare a message that um, ultimately condemns and damns. And I, I've heard him on a number of occasions asked about, well, what about Mormonism? What about, and what he will say consistently is, well, you know, I haven't really, I haven't really looked into that. I haven't really, and my immediate response to that is, okay, he's, he's, his claim is that he's a pastor. It is his duty before God to look into all these claims about God and to know what they are and to be able to say, is this in concert with scripture or isn't it and to and it comes back to prosperity jared because if you start saying there is one narrow way and if you're not in that way you're going to perish there's a lot of people who are willing to listen to joel osteen because the way is wide and broad and many of those people send money to his ministry and for him to uh preach and teach in a way that jesus and the apostles did would cost his ministry dearly and it, it, it comes down to an issue of money that I'm I'm I will only say so much because to say more will cost. And that is at the heart of it. Um. See, Jared, just real quickly, you, you, you and I, we have to judge teachers not only on what they do say to us, but on what they won't say to us. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And that's that's a good example. As absolutely. Well. You, I'm not going to say this because I don't I can't say this and I right. can't do that. Um. 
I want to talk to you about the uh, the the money aspect of it. Um, about does that mean we shouldn't be making money? I, w- I want to get into that, but I, before we do, before I lose my train of thought, so that the message that uh, of the prosperity gospel, right? How is that any different than than say this message that you've heard probably before this type of thing? Uh, a lot of these clips are from Larry King, by the way. This is when I got the secret thing, but I didn't know it was called the secret. I read the book The Color Purple and then went out and got books for everybody else I knew. And I was obsessed about this story, obsessed about it. I ate, slept, thought all the time about The Color Purple. I moved to Chicago. I get a call from a casting agent asking, would I like to come and audition for a movie? I've never gotten a call in my life from anybody for a movie or anything like that. And I say, is it The Color Purple? And he says, no, it's a movie called Moonsong. And I go, well, I've been praying for the color purple. And I go to the audition, and of course it was the color purple. I audition. Pray. I don't hear anything for months. And I go to this, this fat farm, and I think it's because I'm fat, because I was about 212 pounds at the time. And I think I didn't get the call back because I'm so fat. And I'm at this fat farm, and I'm praying and crying, saying to God, help me let this go. Because I wanted to be in this movie so much. I wanted it, I wanted it, I wanted it. I thought I was going to be in the movie. There's all these signs that I should be in the movie. And I go to this fat farm, and I'm praying and crying. And as I'm on the track singing the song, I surrender all, I surrender all, all to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. I'm singing that song, praying and crying. A woman comes out to me, and she says, on the track, it's raining, and she says, there's a phone call for you. And the phone call was Steven Spielberg saying, I want to see you in my office in California tomorrow. Now, what I learned from that... It, that Wait, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, Oprah, hold on. Um, so, th- this is actually pretty similar to what you've been hearing through some of the other people that we've been playing, okay? Using... Invoking the name of God for something. I was praying about it. I was singing about it. Uh, this is what I, I, but it's what I wanted. It's why I wanted what I wanted. And let, let's hear how, uh, what Oprah came to, the decision she came to here. It really changed my life forever because I had drawn the oh. color purple into my life. I didn't right. know Steven Spielberg. I didn't know Quincy Jones, who saw me in Chicago. Yeah. In 1984, he was he was there for a lawsuit that was being filed against Michael Jackson because he'd been working on his his thriller album. So and it's something she had to do to draw it to AM her. She had to do it. She drew it said, to her. Right. That's Sophia. Now, I didn't know him. I didn't know anybody that had anything to do with that. But I knew that I had drawn that into my life. Yeah. And it changed the way I thought about my life forever. So you're not surprised at the success of The Secret? I am. I'm thrilled for the, the success of The Secret. I think that uh, the message needs to go further because I think the mistake that was made with The Secret is that they tried to, uh, they, don't know who they are, that they tried to let that be the answer to all questions. Okay. Not- so... That I mean, same kind of. Ma- how is the, the 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 thing that people are preaching the prosperity gospel? How is it any different from? It's from really that? it's essentially not, Jared. It's just another packaging of it. And you know the devil. Um, you know, let me just say as I listen to that, here's my first thought: the devil answers prayers too. Um, he does. If 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 he knows we want something badly enough, um, and that we're willing to compromise truth about God, he'll he he can send it, and he'll do that with this deceptive goal in mind that the the per, the person on the receiving end can then think, oh, this was God, and they can talk about it being God. And you can even throw Jesus in there if you want to, because ultimately, if you listen to Oprah, um, Oprah, there are many ways to God. All this has not led to her believing Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. Mm-hmm. It has led to, a, you know, there are many roads that lead. So if the devil knows somebody wants something badly enough, but they're not committed to the truth of God badly enough, he'll, he'll send them things in their lives. So just know that the devil answers prayers too. But that... That uh, the secret is just a—it's the whole word of faith. Basically, speak it, 
if you speak it and believe it, it will happen. Or the secret, it's, I think it's like a combination of word of faith and karma almost that you, if you speak, if you speak out positive, you'll get positive. If you speak negative, you'll get negative. Yeah, that's what, I mean, it's in one of the clips that Joel Olstein just said as well, it's, that you, you, vis- you, you, you visualize it, visualize it, it'll happen, visualize it. And so in all these different clips, it's the same thing as, it's even the same thing as witchcraft that you are doing something to make it happen. Well, you either yeah. you're being good enough to make it happen or you're praying hard enough to right. make it happen or whatever. Now, in, in the prosperity gospel, of course, because we got to have a kernel of truth in there, it's faith. Yeah, but you're the one that... Well, yeah, you 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 speak it, and then you believe it, and then you'll come to verses, ask, and you shall receive. The, you know, this is, this is the danger. We'll go get some verses, right? Nothing shall be impossible to you. All these things. Um, and, of course, the end result of that is that you're prosperous and healthy. Okay, um, this brings us correctly back to what we had talked about right before the break, which was ask and, and you shall receive. Um, give me some context for that. Um, well, the context, I guess, of ask, first of all, I think we've got to let what Jesus says stand. And while we may have concerns about error, uh-huh. there are we can throw the baby out with the bathwater and actually cut the very life out of real promises and there are promises from the Lord Jesus um, that if we have faith that nothing will be impossible he says that he says to many people that he healed your faith has made you well Um, the one we're mentioning ask and it will be given to you Um, but the context of those things Jared is I would say Matthew uh, 6 where Jesus says but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What we're to seek first is the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what that in a kernel means, the life that God means for us to have in his son, which is first and foremost to focus on that, which is eternal, not temporal, um, which brings into it all the things that that means, which often means um, denial of self, um, a life that is counter to this world, quite honestly. James says, if anyone loves this world, he's an enemy of God. So the context of asking you shall receive means within God's priorities. Mm -hmm. It does not mean that God becomes my errand boy who runs and fetches everything that I wish for and want because I say I have faith. That promise is in the context of God's priorities, his eternal kingdom priorities, not my life in this world and every whim that strikes me about what I think I might like to have. God isn't Santa, in other words. Right, right. One one of the other uh, passages you hear a lot is uh, uh, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens Mm -hmm. me. Uh, I can do all things. Mm -hmm. But again, I mean, uh, you, you can't just pick things out without sort of knowing what what is around it you know you taking things out of context or what have you absolutely no because there'd be a number of things that you know and some of them might not even be appreciated that i i could say you can't um i can do all things through christ who strengthens me um all things huh yeah well you say well all things means all things Uh, could i go solicit a prostitute then because christ strengthens me I mean, if we start... I mean, that is, that's, that's a, a blatantly, right. I'm, I'm being obvious on purpose. But no. like Oprah, if we all start just deciding what God wants for us, we start deciding that we decide that we want to be in this movie, and, uh, you know, it's, it's right. God that gave it to us. Well, and here, Jared, is this essential truth about God that we've got to remember. God is a father. Our father, which art in heaven. Okay, I have children. My children want many, many, many things. When I... and. Listen, I don't want to pick on them. I want many, many, many <laughs> things, right? Fathers don't give their children everything they want, do they? There, there are many times when as a father you say, you know, I know you want that. But if you were to have that or if you were to get everything, what that would do to you would not be a good thing. It would spoil you. Um, you're going to get your heart set on. And so there are many times as a yeah. father where you say no. Right. God is a father. Which, and he's the perfect father. So that means that God's answer a significant number of times in terms of my desires and wants is no. Um, 
How do we see that in human fatherhood, but we don't get that with God? I don't know. It, it reminds me of uh, the uh, statements I've heard people make. Who knows? I might have made it myself in the past. I don't, I don't remember. Um, well, I, I I asked God for something. He didn't give it to me, so God doesn't exist. Because, I mean, asking you shall receive. I asked God for that. But the realization that I came to, Gary, was uh, many, many times people who... People are asking for things from something, somebody that they do not actually believe in. They're at, they're going to they're going to a god that they don't believe in, and they're asking, "Give me a." I'm going to pick on Oprah. Give me the part in this movie, The Color Purple. Give me the. But in reality, what else are you doing for God? And I'm not saying you have to do anything, but do you actually believe? But that, no, because God doesn't give you that. You don't. He does. He's not real. He doesn't exist. Yeah, and you know my my immediate thought. In regard to Oprah, as what does the what has this led to with her? Right. Is is this was this a good thing that you know her her position is there are many roads to heaven, so I'm I, I'm to believe God did this for her and that the end result of this is not the the narrow way that is in His Son alone, but there are many roads to. If that was from God, you know I'll eat my hat. I don't. So, you know, yeah. what God does for his children, the end result of that is always to always leads to truth and it always leads to what's good for them spiritually. And when people are getting things in their lives and what it's actually leading them to is straying from truth, it's not from God. That's why that's why I said the devil answers sure. prayers. I got it. I got it. OK, your question. Someone says I ask. I mean, the Bible addresses these things. Um, first of all, the Apostle John says to us. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. So there's a context, isn't there? Okay? Here's James. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives, mm. so that you may spend it on your pleasures. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Here's James saying, I know you're asking. And you're not receiving, and here's why. You ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. Right. There's why you, that, that's why you didn't get So the Bible doesn't just throw a promise out and leave it without clarification and without boundaries. Um, okay, I, I, I'm going to... Let me ask you first of all, how do you know, Gary? How do you know if somebody that you're paying attention to is preaching the, you know, the truth? Or the, how, do, how do you know? Well, Jared, I think... Uh, the first thing we've got to say in answering that is we've got to be people who read and study the Bible for ourselves and that we are not ultimately people who are always looking for someone else to tell us what God has said and what he means. God has a purpose for teachers um, and there should be teaching. But ultimately, you and I have to stand before God in regard to the truth ourselves. And I can't say Gary Knapp said that right. or Joel Osteen said that or God's given you and me his word. And you and I have to be reading it. We've got to be studying it. We've got to be asking God. To, and, and Jared, part of my answer is that when we're God's, the Holy Spirit is our teacher and he is a protective teacher and he has a way um, that he warns us about things that we're hearing mm -hmm. that are not really of God. Um, and so when we're rooted in the truth uh, and we're hearing things that are counter to that, if we're, if we're sensitive, we, he has a way of warning us. But I would say, Jared, that um, how do we know when I'm hearing a message and we've already established that could well include Jesus, God's son, yeah. died on the cross, forgiveness of sins, but when I'm getting this additional um, emphasis on this life, the things of this life, the things I can have in this life, the quality of life I can have, the, the always, always being able to get relieved of something if I have faith, whether that's from my illnesses or my marriage troubles or whatever. And when I'm finding that the teacher is regularly often asking me to give, to give, and to give to their ministries, okay, folks, that is a flashing red light. Uh, but, but, I mean, you go to a church, and the church takes collections, right? Well, because they're, but again, Jared, this is, this is the kernel of truth that gets perverted. 
because it is God's will for his people to give to the work of his kingdom. We, we are to tithe and to give offerings. It's, it's a demonstration of our faith and gratitude. The scriptures command it. But um, when you're in a church or you're listening to a ministry, and just think of how many television ministries we're actually talking about right now, where there's an emphasis on this, okay? When it's being brought up many times in a church service or many times in a television broadcast, and when that is including this, and if you give this believing you're going to you're going to get back da -da 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 -da, and they'd say, "Well, hey, go to Malachi, doesn't God say, "Bring the tithe into the storehouse, and I'll open the window of heaven and pour out a blessing on you Yes, he does say that, but when you're getting a ministry that seems to be built on that, mm -hmm. and this is where I mean, Jared, I'll be honest with you, maybe even to a fault. I've been at uh, my church nine years, and I've probably preached five messages on giving. Hmm. And three of them I preached when my elders and my wife came to me and said, we think you, you've not been... Now, I'm not saying that to be praised, but what I'm saying is, should there be te teaching on giving in a church? Yes, there should. Is that from God yes it is but when that seems to be the consistent message over and over and over all services all broadcasts with these great promises of what God's gonna do if you give I mean forgive my frankness but I I mean folks if, if you don't see that I mean right. <laughs> what do I say uh, what do, what do you say? Do, do you not do you not see the flashing red light? If it, if you're constantly hearing about money, it's because it's about money. That's why. See, the problem is, I think people want they want to give. I think the people that uh, are are trying to or have come to God, they want to try. They want to open, and yeah. not because although maybe some people because they want rewards as a result. I'm sure there's some of that. But there are rewards. See, that's the danger, Jared. God does. God does say if I bring the tithe into the, the, to the storehouse, he will pour out, he'll open the windows of heaven. He does say that. Right. See, that's the danger because they take a truth and then they pervert it. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, if you do, if you do tithe, if you do give offerings, you're not doing it because you want something in return. I mean, you, you probably, you might be, but I mean, that's not why. I'm going not... I'm, I'm to seem to contradict everything. I'm, <laughs> because, Jared, God, God does hold before us incentive and reward to have faith and to believe true see and, you know people say well wait are, what are you saying are you saying this or that and, and this is the subtlety because there is a kernel of truth in the prosperity gospel that God does reward us when we have faith he does do things that are impossible um, he does make us well sometimes you know what I mean? he does take pain away from us and he does but whenever I reduce God down to an equation and I come to believe that as long as I speak something and believe it, God is in a sense obligated to do that and that his will is for all his children to have this kind of life. Now a beautiful truth in kernel has been perverted and you're in a whole, and you know, you played the, the clip from John Piper, uh -huh. so very powerful. What, what does the prosperity gospel have to say to the suffering that's going on in the world? Well, you know, I want to talk to you about that. Um, let, me, let me jump to the very beginning of that, where he says that this is a message coming out of America. Yeah. It's a very, if you even hear it, it sounds like a very American thing, doesn't it? Yeah, well, yes, because America is, what, what, what are we? We're the, um, our prosperity has ruined us in a sense, hasn't it, in regard to God? Um, you know, if you, if, you, if you look back to America in our earlier times, which included a lot of adversity, right, struggle, wars, was there not a, a, a more healthy and accurate belief in God and dependence upon him? What, what happened when you started getting to the mid-50s mm -hmm. um, and the prosperity that seemed to follow the Second World War? I mean, it's not long you're in the 60s and God dropped dead. And, you know, now we're 40 years past that, and we're just into full-blown, brazen um, living for pleasure, right? I mean, essentially. Yeah. 
Um, so yes, this, this comes out of America because America, in a sense, leads the world in materialism. It leads the world in you can have what you want. So we are the exporters of the prosperity gospel. You had a, a missionary at church talking about this? La Zambia? Uh, our, one of our missionaries we support, David Wagner, he and his family serve God in Zambia. Uh, we didn't have him because of the prosperity. It just happened that as he gave us his report last Sunday, he was sharing with us how prevalent the prosperity gospel is in Zambia. And Piper mentioned it. Okay, what if I believe in Jesus, my pigs won't die, my wife won't have miscarriages. And you see what you're setting people up there for, because this, the, while we're in this fallen world, your pigs are going to die and your wife is going to have miscarriages and your, ch your, your daughter may be thrown through the windshield in an accident. And, and that message is, well, no, see, God, God will put a hedge around you. God will. So what, what do we say to these people whose pigs die, who, whose wives miscarriage and whose daughters are thrown through windshields? Do we say you, you, you're not having enough faith? Mm hmm I have my partner in the ministry for a number of years before I came here, uh, David Bailey, his parents and his father, an author named Joe Bailey, wrote a book called A View from the Hearst. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Bailey, they had three sons who died before Mr. Bailey died in the mid-80s. And you know that in the, the context of the death of some of their children, they had Christians who came to them while their children were ill and basically said to them, um, the message was, your child died because you didn't have enough faith. Is this, is this what we're going to say to people when uh, cancer takes one of their loved ones? or their? Because, Jared, if you take the prosperity gospel at its logical end, you and I should never die. We, we should, any illness that comes, we just believe and it will be healed. There should be Christians who are 600 years old walking around on earth because faith will make you well. We, the, the logical end of the prosperity gospel is you and I should live eternally while we're still in this realm. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, I can't keep going back to the secret ever since I, th there was a thing on, on Larry King um, where one of the guys was talking about the secret and it, cause it sounds it's so similar to it to me. Um, it's just repackaging. He they, they asked him if the girl, there was a girl in Florida. She was raped and murdered. And uh, Larry King uh, said, well, did she did, did she do this to herself? And the guy said, yeah, she did it to herself because she didn't believe enough or mm -hmm. she didn't uh, project or visualize that this was going to happen to that. She was going to be safe. It's the same message. It's the same message. Yeah, and, and Jared, we were saying early on that um, it is a terrible thing that there is suffering in this world, which we brought on ourselves through the fall. But until God makes all things new again, the fall is still at work. There is still death. There is still suffering, illness, poverty. But the beautiful thing is that in the gospel, God takes suffering. He takes poverty. He takes uh, diseases and illnesses and he actually displays his glory through them so that as we referenced through the apostle paul earlier when god says to paul i'm not going to heal you of this thing that you've asked me about three times because my strength is perfected in weakness so when people see the apostle paul and whether it was he couldn't half see or whatever it was but they see the power of god coming out of him when they see this joy in god that his joy isn't linked to his health that was Piper's message, that yeah. when my daughter goes through the windshield, am I devastated? Does this rock my world to its very core? Of course it does. But underneath all that, there is a, there's a peace and a joy that abides because it's not linked to what I have in this world. It's, it's, it's God himself. And somehow we're not getting this in the main. We, we think the way God is most honored is I've got a lot of things and he always heals me. You mentioned to me, and I think we're going to think for a minute about Johnny Erickson Todd of this. I'll play something out of the break. This yeah. dear young lady who dives into a swimming pool is uh, made a quadriplegic who goes through her thing. God, heal me. God doesn't heal her. Her whole life, she's been a quadriplegic, and her life is one of the most beautiful things you will ever hear about or witness because she knows the Lord Jesus. And his presence is so obvious in her life, and it's because he is what sustains her, not her ability to walk and get up and, and move around. 
And it's a, you know, it's a very hard story, but God does do this with his children to show the world, I am able to be something to you that this world cannot be to you, nor can it give it to you. Right. Pastor Gary Knapps here from the Eastgate Presbyterian Church in Long Neck, and he joins us uh, about once a month um, to talk about different issues of, of faith. And uh, lately, even, even, uh, even more so, we've been uh, talking about issues inside the church that... Uh, um, to be honest with you, one of the reasons why I why I'm passionate about it is because I feel like I've been I had been lied to for for a long time. Not that I believed this stuff, the prosperity gospel stuff, or but um, I, I feel like it kept me away from uh, the church for for a very long time because I th- heard people preaching this kind of stuff. Like many people, I see them on TV. You know, I hear them on the radio. Uh, people like this, uh, and uh, you know, it turns me off. There's something. Uh, that resonates inside you that that this isn't right and you know it's not right because you hear it too and maybe this is what you think Christianity is maybe you think that this is what Christians believe um, I know that for I know that I did you know I know that uh, for a very long time I thought that this was the type of thing that uh, that Christians believed and you know it it kept me away uh, so a little bit later on in the program we're going to talk about what the what the truth of it all is um, uh the prosperity gospel, health, wealth, you know, happiness. Gary, you were telling me during the break that uh, you wanted to talk to us a little bit about benefits from adversity, though, that good things do come out of things that are tough. Yes, and Jared, that quite honestly, uh, most of the good things you and I gain in regard to our faith and the health of our soul tend to come to us by way of adversity and suffering and that um, Jesus himself what does the scripture say he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief Um, Jesus wasn't jetted around the world on a privately owned jet um, dressed in two thousand dollar suits he he lived lowly in this world and um, his daily life was um, filled with labor um, being neck deep in the reality of sin and the the struggles of human beings and so if if the path that our savior tread was a lowly path um the path of sorrows then that's the path you and i've got to be on and the truth is that god never means more to us nor do we come to know his grace more than when we're in adversity and i I wanted to share a quote with you if i a uh, couple of them just briefly from a, a pastor from another age by the name of Charles Spurgeon. And um, Spurgeon, um, he's called the Prince of Preachers and not without reason, a uh, tremendous soul winner, a man of great faith, and yet his life, um, first of all, he struggled with uh, extended bouts of depression. Um, he also suffered from gout, very um, painful battles with gout amongst other illnesses and um let me just share a couple quick quotes from him i dare say the greatest earthly blessing that god can give to any of us is health with the exception of sickness if some men that i know could only be favored with a month of rheumatism it would by god's grace mellow them marvelously see god teaches us when we suffer and he changes us when we suffer um let me read this other quote he says I'm afraid that all the grace that I've got out of my comfortable easy times and happy hours could rest on a penny but the good that I've received from my sorrows and pains and grief are altogether incalculable affliction is the best bit of furniture in my house it is the best book in a minister's library and what he's saying essentially is the the most worthwhile helpful things that i've received from god actually have not come from my health and my easy days they've actually come from my suffering and my because what what does suffering and adversity do it makes us focus on god doesn't it mm-hmm. there there's no distraction in suffering when you're suffering your focus is honed isn't it mm-hmm. and i'm not saying that part of that isn't that you want it don't want it to end of course you do and and that may be part of what we're coming to god for but what we find when we're suffering is that god shows us something about who he is 
that even when he chooses not to heal us or chooses and says, I'm going to get more glory and more people are going to believe in me because you're ill, that there's a peace that comes from his presence that sustains you. And you can even say, Lord, then if that's your will, then that's what I want. And that is priceless. It is apt that no money can buy that. So one of the many issues we would have with the prosperity gospel is that it doesn't, first of all, it has no answer for the world's suffering, really. If you're just going to go tell people in all these countries, believe and you're going to get all this stuff, um, that's not going to happen. So then what do we do with these deceived people who believed in Jesus and their, their pigs still die and their wives still miscarry? We've actually driven them from the faith. And even more, what it does is it it denies the, the central truth of the Christian faith, which is God is never closer to us than when we're brokenhearted, suffering, and that God has a purpose in this. Um, can I just, real quick, Jared, um, the claim of the prosperity gospel is if you have faith, you'll prosper. Mm -hmm. Listen to what the Bible says. James 2, verse 5 Listen, my beloved brethren, did not God choose the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? You know who, who James says are the people who are rich in faith? The poor. Has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith? We say, oh, if you have faith, you'll be rich. Mm -hmm. you no, know, James says, no, if you're poor, you're rich in faith. It's, do you see how it's the opposite of the Bible? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I, I hear this, and I, I, I'm, I, I try to figure out what, what people are, or what I might have said at one time. Does that mean that you're not, does all this mean that you're, the poor are the ones, does that mean that you're not to try to succeed, try right. to be successful, try to get good right. things, try to have nice things. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I can hear many of the teachers on TBN now, they're saying, oh, yeah, he's he's advocating a, a mediocrity um, that, you know, we're not supposed to, if I'm a Christian and I have a business, I'm not to try to succeed and do well. Um, well, that's not what we're saying at all. What we're saying is, what is the priority and what is it really that our heart is after? And we, we've got to know the truth about our hearts. Jeremiah 17, our, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. So I can say, oh, this is all about God. I love God. I love Jesus. I want the kingdom. When very subtly what has happened is that we've actually loved this world. So um, should we as Christians try to succeed? Should we try to do well? Certainly if we can honestly say, Matthew 6, that we are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's from that that Jesus says, and all these things shall be added to you. If we're seeking the kingdom and his righteousness, and it's certainly true that God blesses some of his people with wealth. I mean, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they weren't poor men. David wasn't poor. Solomon wasn't poor. So, but what I would say about every one of those men, Jared, is that is not what they were after. Mm -hmm. And that God bestows this on his people when it's not first for them. So we were talking about Solomon. God actually comes to Solomon in the night and says, ask me for anything. Now, I just ask our listeners, if God came to you tonight and said, ask me for any one thing, what would you ask for? Solomon's response is he wants wisdom. He's the king of Israel. Give me wisdom that I can lead this people. So God says, all right, I'm going to give you wisdom and to a degree that there'll be no one before you or after you who can match you in your wisdom. And then he says, because you didn't ask me for long life or wealth or victory over your enemies, I'm going to, I'll give you that too. He gets it because he didn't look for it. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And God is pleased to make Solomon maybe one of the maybe maybe the wealthiest man who's ever lived. But he that was not what he was after. And God gave it to him. And I this is this is the difference that God bestows these things on his children when he sees he's first with them. Um, it, doesn't it say that no no man seeketh God, though, that n nobody does that? Well, left to ourselves without grace. Yes. But. 
it's his grace that causes us to. But, you know, Jared, what I would say in regard to God giving this to his children, he always reserves the right to take it at any moment. You're talking about Job before. Job. I mean, what, what does the prosperity gospel have to say to Job? Okay, here's a man who's extremely wealthy, right? Blessed family. On, on one day, all his possessions essentially are taken. All his children are killed. And he, um, in a short time, is struck from head to toe with with horrible boils and sores. What are you, oh, well, you know, we know what his friend said. Well, you've obviously sinned. That's why this has happened to you. See, it's the equation. See, you, li you live righteously and you believe and you're healthy and you're wealthy and your kids never die, but you sin and now these bad things happen. It wasn't that Job had sinned, right? And what Job, this is the beauty of Job, that it says that Job says the Lord has given the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. See, God reserves the right to give whatever he wants to us as his children, and he reserves the right to take it at any moment, and we have no right to it. He may grant it for a season, and he may take it away. That can be our health, that can be our children, that can be our possessions. There is no system that God has laid in place that guarantees you and I get those things as long as we have faith. That's a lie. Um, and And not different from any of the number of teachings from from other faiths as well i mean in fact I, I that's what makes christianity different that it doesn't promise that that if you you know karma that you know you right. the things that you do cause bad right. things to happen to you because what, what 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 christianity promises me is salvation from my god and father and now i am his to do with whatever he decides is best if he decides to in the course of my life give me uh, much health and make me successful in my work, then I'll praise him and thank him for it. And if he chooses to allow me to suffer health problems most of my life and struggle to meet my bills. See, I didn't come to him to get health and I didn't come to him to get money. I came to him because he made me and he's saving me. And now whatever he wants to do with me is fine. That's, that's Christianity. Mm -hmm. Um, so let me let me read our listeners one of my most favorite two verses. Um, this is Habakkuk chapter three. Listen, here's here's the real faith. You're digging deep if you're going to Habakkuk. Yes, read all the Bible, please. Though the fig tree should not blossom, and there be no fruit on the vines, though the yield of the olive should fail, and the fields produce no food. Though the flock should be cut off from the fold and there be no cattle in the stalls, yet I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength and he has made my feet like hinds feet and makes me walk on my high places. See, there, there's someone who loves God. And if, if, if all fails, if there's the trees don't produce, there's no cattle, I will still exalt in God my Savior. That, that is the, that's the faith, not the believe and you will, the fig tree will blossom and there will be fruit on the vines and your olives. And I mean, that's to me the challenge that, 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 that we all face, that people who uh, even espouse to be Christians right now, uh, do you feel that way in times of adversity, when when things aren't going well, when it's not paying off? Are you right? Because it, it, it's the times of adversity that God shows us He is enough. See, I don't know that if I'm not brought to that level. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's when God essentially takes it from me that I come to learn He can be everything to me, and He is very willing to do that because that's what He wants us to know. Um. So, you know, Jared, you played the clip from John MacArthur there, and I just would echo what he said. The prosperity gospel essentially is a pyramid scheme. And in a pyramid scheme, there are a small handful that get the goods, and you have the top of it, and so that would be all the high-profile, nationally known, uh, essentially, ver almost everybody on TBN, okay? Then underneath the top, you have the next level, and these are the more local guys. So Baltimore has its prosperity guys. Dover has its prosperity. You know, they haven't hit the biggest big. Yeah. Okay, but they're the next level down. And then as the pyramid broadens out at the bottom, you're at the local churchgoer. 
who is being told by those above him or her, see what you can have if you have faith. And it's this perpetual appealing to what they see what you've got. Oh, I want that too. Here's how you get it. You have faith and you give money to me. It's a pyramid scheme. Plain and simple, it is a pyramid scheme. And in a pyramid scheme, there's always a handful that get the goods and the greater um, number at the bottom of the pyramid, you know, only a few of those ever, but just enough make it to the top so that the great majority think, oh, that can, it's the lottery, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, why, why are people out buying lottery tickets? Well, because there is a winner, right? And you're telling yourself, you know what, I'm going to win one day, I'm going to win one day, I'm going to win one day, and you're not, you're not going to win. So the prosperity gospel is here, are these guys, and wow, they, it did happen for them, it's going to happen for me. The simple truth is for millions and millions and millions and millions of people, it's never going to happen, but the ones at the top did, and that is the deception through which the majority are led astray. You're listening to Jared Morris. Call Jared now at 945-9292. Toll free in Maryland, 1-800-518-9292. Or free on the Verizon Wireless Network. Pound 927 on your cell phones. Now let's look at this invitation. God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Many times this is accompanied by an explanation of all that Jesus can do for the person. Fix their life, their marriage, their finances, their self-esteem. So you walk up to what we know about a sinner. He is self-centered, he's autonomous, he wants to do his own thing, he has his own dreams, and he is in love with himself. So you walk up to this man and you say, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. And he goes, what? God loves me? That's fantastic! I love me too! Well, this is wonderful! And you're even saying that he loves me more than I love me? Now that sounds impossible. How could anyone have such a great love? And God has a wonderful plan for my life. Oh, I have a wonderful plan for my life too! And you're telling me that if I accept this Jesus, he will help me with all my wonderful plans and I can have my best life now? Yes! Well then, I'll take a God like that. You got two of them? <laughs> Do you see that? Now you say, Brother Paul, it's, it, we don't mean it that way. That's a... But that's the way it's coming out. Now you're saying, Paul, you're being very hard, full of satire. Yes, I am. I am. But look, everybody is lamenting the fact that this country believes it's saved. When it's no more saved than a... It's as lost, as they say in Alabama, as a ball in tall grass. But no one wants to point to what the problem is. And the problem is, even when we preach the gospel correctly, then we go to this thing of how to invite men that's not biblical or historical. We get them to jump through a few evangelical hoops and say yes to the appropriate questions, and we popishly pronounce them to be saved. And when they believe that false religious lie given by a religious authority, then when someone comes later and tries to preach the gospel to them because they're living in the world, they won't listen. We fact check things that politicians say. You know, we don't believe things that we hear in uh, the news and media and radio and all that. But I, I don't think everybody's fact checking things that uh, that they hear from from preachers. Right. And you, there's a website. Yeah, I'd like to uh, encourage our listeners to. There's a website. It's ministrywatch.org. Okay, so ministrywatch.org. That it? Yes. Okay. That's it. And. Um, this ministry, basically, their work is to um, give reports on various ministries, um, most the more, mostly the more high-profile ministries, um, what their, the incomes of the ministries are, um, what the incomes of the leaders of those ministries are, the spending reports, the, uh, the tax filings of these ministries. And uh, I would really encourage our listeners to go to them, ministrywatch.org. Wow. And, um, you know, what you will find is that uh, many of the people that you see on television 
Um, their ministries are taking in literally millions and millions and millions of dollars. Their leaders are being paid millions of dollars. Um, they tend to stock the uh, stack the boards of their ministries with uh, relatives, family members who then are also paid large sums of money. Um, you learn about some of their purchases, how many of these uh, ministries have uh, some of them multiple private jets, uh, multiple homes. And um, so, Jared, you know, I, I want to be specific for just a moment here, if I can. Yes. Um, I know our listeners, some of them are going to know what I'm talking about. Um, I'm describing for you essentially TBN, Trinity Broadcasting Network, would be a chief um, you go to ministrywatch.org, and they're going to say to you, you should not give to TBN. Um, quite honestly, I'm not sure why a Christian wants to spend time on that network. I'm not saying that there aren't some exceptions on there who've put their ministries on there, maybe with the hope of, you know, maybe we can rescue people. Um, but in the main, it's just so very dangerous. And... Um, you know, I was thinking earlier, Jared, the, the first century Christians, do you realize all they had was the scriptures and the Holy Spirit? Mm -hmm. They didn't have television preachers. They didn't have bookstores. They didn't have conferences. They didn't have Christian CDs. And can we compare their spiritual health with ours? Um, we've got all this Christian stuff. We've got ties. We've got Christian breath mints. We have Christian cufflinks. We have, and we're sick. We're sick, sick. So um, I, I do want to say to some people, I want to talk to two groups just quickly. You know, there, there are people who might honestly say, you know, I'm not a Christian uh, and I see this stuff. Okay, the simple message to you is to get away from it. Yeah. Do not watch it. Do not listen to it. Get into the Bible, get to a church that is committed to teaching the scriptures. But then I also want to say to, and I'm sure there are many believers who hear, are hearing us, who watch these ministries and go to churches that preach this message. And I just want to speak frankly to them. At some level, you're disobeying God by supporting these ministries and going to these churches. You need to examine your own heart about why you sit under a teaching like this and help make it happen. Um, you, need to, you need to turn away from these things and get back to a biblical gospel because, you know, the day is coming when God is going to reveal all things for what they are. And you don't, you don't want to be standing near these things when God deals with them. And, and we've got to weigh our own hearts and say, why do I want to sit under this teaching? Um, and maybe have to admit that we've been um, taken in, and very willingly so, that our own hearts have wanted to go this route. So, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not doing this broadcast to no end today. There, there's an application of all this, and you and I need to think about where we're at and make sure that we're standing with God in his uh, Truth. I don't know what's worse to me. Uh, they're both probably equally offensive. Um, that this type of message I know has either led people astray or kept people away, and and both are so mm -hmm. just dark and evil to me because I know because I was one of them. Somebody who sees these people on TV and I think that I that the, that's what the, that's what these crazy Christians are. Oh, it's just these crazy Christians. That's not you know that's what they're all about. Look at look at all they want is money and all they want. Yeah, and if I could only add to that, Jared, that there are many people out there who are avoiding Christ and his claim as Lord of their lives, and they've, they've learned how to take the prosperity teachers as their excuse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, if they're not careful, what they're going, what's going to happen with them is they're going to end up standing before Christ, and they're going to try to say, well, um, Jimmy Swaggart and Kenneth Copeland and... You and I are responsible for our souls before God, and he's given us his word. And if we're not right with him on the day of judgment, we're not going to be able to point to anyone, regardless of what kind of charlatans they were, and get off with God. So, you know, if, if you're a listener and you're one of these people who've been pointing to, you know, these prosperity God, and this is why you haven't bowed your knee to Christ. Well, I just want to tell you, it's not going to wash on the great day. 
God's handed you his truth and his word, and you'd better get into it because pointing at someone else on the judgment day isn't going to rescue you. Right, not because Gary Knapp says so, because I can hear somebody saying that right now. Well, what do you know? Why, wh- how do you know any better? What, do you, what, what authority do you mm, come from? Yeah, well, don't listen to me. You don't need me to arrive at the conclusion. Read the word of, read the word of God, and it's, it's not necessary for me to be in the equation for it to be true. It's true. If I'd never existed, it'd still be true, so... Uh, and that's what I want to ask you. I want to ask you because well, uh, two two quick things um, for the person that is doing well, right? I mean, this, right. it's not going to work for them. The person that's doing well, if you say, "Hey, you know, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life," I'm doing fine right now by myself. I've got a you know a nice house, four hundred sixty five thousand dollar house right down at the beach. I've got a good job. I've got a good family. What do I need? Yeah. What, what does God have for me? And I and and I I people who have listen to messages like the prosperity gospel before i've tried it and i was it, it wasn't all it was uh they offered me a bill of goods and they didn't uh, they didn't they didn't pay on it I, it's not what they promised me so what is the truth gary what is it that uh you know for somebody that says uh what what's in it for me what's in it for us okay well <laughs> i guess where we've got I'd to purposely be, be yes you know, i know and it's a fair because there is something in it for us to be honest with you um but this all, where we've got to begin, Jared, is who and what are we as human beings? And depending on your answer to that question, that will then determine what you decide to do with your life and what you think is important about the message of the scriptures to us is that what we are and who we are as humans is we, we are creatures who've been made by God in the image of God and that as he made us originally... And our first parents, Adam and Eve, he made them and they possessed a relationship with God um, by which they could be in God's very presence, talk with God, and all was well with them and God. And then there's this event that the Bible tells us happened. We call it the fall. Our first parents disobeyed the God who made them and essentially said, we want to be God ourselves. So if you think of what Satan said to Eve, if you God knows that in the day you'll eat from this, you'll be like God. So there was this rejection of God that led to a separation from God because God's holy and sin is evil in his sight. And so now we're the sons and daughters of Adam. We come into this world living physically but dead spiritually and separated from the God who made us. And because God is holy and just, he has to give sin what it deserves. And what sin deserves is death, and it deserves separation from him because God isn't going to have sin where he is. So every one of us, we are born into this world. We get a certain number of years to live, but we're not just flesh and bone. We're most essentially, we're spirit. We're a spirit, and our spirit, when this life is over, is going to go stand before a holy God and give an account for itself. And what the gospel comes and tells us is that God, in his love for us, God does love us, doesn't want us to experience the separation that we're destined for if we remain in our sin, and that he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to receive in our place as our substitute the punishment our sin deserves. And that because Jesus was punished in our place through faith in what he did for us, our sins are forgiven and you and I are granted by God a complete and absolute forgiveness um, that we experience right now immediately that restores us into a relationship with him, makes us his children, makes him our father in this world and life. And that will then bring us into his presence, the Bible says, without spot, without blame, and in great joy to live with him eternally. Um, Two things. Separation from, what is separation from God? Well, in in its most basic explanation, it is to be out of his presence. um, And that God then has created a place for those who have rebelled against him and refuse his offer of forgiveness. Uh, The Bible calls that place hell. And so we're not only separated from God, but then God also has created this place where justice is going to be served 
on rebels um, for all eternity. So the separation is not in his presence and actually in a location of, in a place where God is dealing out his justice on those who've rebelled against him. If, if the punishment for being a sinner is death, we all die anyway, right? So what does that mean? And we only have a couple of minutes. Right. And what about, I, 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 I'm, not a good, I'm a good person. Look what that person died. I'm, I'm, I'm a good person. I'm not a sinner. I, I'm all right. right. Well, good by whose standard? Okay, if we're, if we're using a human standard, I can, almost everybody can find somebody who in their eyes is worse than them. But coming back to what I am is I'm a creature who's been made in the image of God. God made me righteous in my first parents. And so the standard isn't someone else and it's not Hitler and it's not Pol Pot or whatever evil person we want to hold up and say, well, see, I'm not them. The standard is God himself. God made us righteous so what God's going to judge me against is not other people, but his word. And so when I compare my life to his word, I can just take the Ten Commandments and say, I'm in trouble because that's what I'm meant to be. That's what God made me to be. And I'm not that. So we're not fine. The Bible never calls you and me good. It actually says there's none righteous, no, not one. So we're not good. We're not fine. And having a $400,000 house has nothing to do with my standing before holy God on the day of eternity. It can't help me one bit. Um, so what's, what's, what's the next step for people? Get into, a, get into the Bible, uh, get into a good Bible-believing church. I would, you know, those you've said it, Jerry. I mean, come to the Word. Forget, forget everything I've said to you or you. We're not necessary. Go to the Word of God and check to see if what you've heard today is true. And begin to call on God and pray and ask him to show you the truth about him and about yourself and what's important. And then, yes, you want to, it's God's will for us to be connected to other believers. This whole uh, individual, me and Jesus thing, Bible never teaches that. God establishes local churches, families of believers, find a Bible believing church and um, begin to pursue God with others. Don't pick and choose what you believe. If, if, <laughs> if, 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 if some of it's not true, then none of it's true. It's all got to be true. Right. Well, we can't take God cafeteria style. Um, he is who he is and his truth is what it is. And his truth challenges and defends all of us, including pastors. <laughs> um, it's a narrow way and yeah. But he can give the grace to walk that path. That's we got to say that. We can't just say it's narrow. Well, that's hopeless, isn't it? It's narrow, and yet his presence and grace can take us down that path and bring us um, into his presence. Thank you for joining me today. Thanks uh, for having me.